Okay, good evening. Welcome. It's Wednesday, February 28th, 2018. We're in the Freeport High School Library. And everyone is in attendance except for Candy. She is out of town this week. Uh, so we'll get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, uh, do we have a motion for consideration and approval of the minutes from January 24th, 2018 and February 14th, 2018 as presented barring any errors or omissions? Valley, John, thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? None, thank you. Adjustments to the agenda? We want to table the class size discussion so that that can go back oh I'm sorry uh, we want to table the class size policy discussion so that that can go back to the policy committee okay uh, other than that everything looks good yes uh, good news and recognition report from board student rep It's been a very exciting few weeks at Freeport. We just wrapped up our winter sports season and are just beginning to start our One Act Play Festival next weekend. We're performing at regionals at Yarmouth and it's going to be a great time. What day do you know? It's going to be, we're all doing it on one day and it's that Saturday next weekend. Next Saturday. Okay. So the 10th? The 10th. In Yarmouth. Awesome. Good luck. All right. Public comment. If we have anyone who would like to share, we have two public comments on the agenda, one now and one later. Okay. So we will move on to administrative reports, finance. Michelle? Oh, did you skip? Did me? I skip? It? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fine superintendent's report. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder if that's a hint to be briefer. <laughs> Uh, so tonight I'm delighted to report that our girls basketball team went to the regional finals and that was the first time since 1976. Uh, the outcome of Saturday's game was not what we were looking for against Lake Region. However, the community support and the excitement around the basketball team and the game was really truly amazing. A lot of fun to be there. And I hear we have 26 incoming ninth graders who are hungry to compete next year on the basketball team. So we feel we'll have another exciting uh, season next year. And so we feel like the efforts of this year's Lady Falcons will really be felt for years to come. And I also want to congratulate the boys team for qualifying for the postseason for the first time since 2008. So they did a really good job too. Uh, today I received notice that LD 1761 has been defeated. This is the bill that would have allowed a, pers a person to possess a firearm on school property in a motor vehicle as long as the person was dropping off or picking up a student. And the Education Committee gave it an 11 to 1 ought not to pass vote, which really means that for this year, the bill has been defeated and will not be moving on. We're also getting closer to the completion of the high school project. Uh, we've signed off on the lien release, and the last remaining item will really be the replacement of the concrete in the plaza outside of the cafeteria. And then we're going to reconvene the uh, committee to decide how to um, uh, spend the remaining funds. And then we're also getting ready for the grand opening of the track and field. Maddie's helping with that. Um, festive occasion on May 18th. Please mark your calendars for three o'clock when we'll be having the ribbon cutting and then we'll be taking a celebratory lap with uh, Joan Benoit. So wear your sneakers and your uh, running gear. And when I ask, we ask Craig Sickles, how long do you think that'll take? He said a minute. And uh, 
Maddie and I and uh, Kim Lamar and John Patterson, we all moaned in like unison, like, uh, I don't think so. May take a little bit longer than that for some of us. That would be a four minute mile, right? I'm doing the math, <laughs> yeah. right? Okay, just checking. You are. How fast does Craig think we are? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of what we said. Uh, uh, there's also been quite a bit of talk about the potential school walkout on March 14th in remembrance of the shooting in Florida. Uh, our administrative team uh, talked a lot about this yesterday and we've decided to accommodate the walkout while remaining politically neutral. Uh, there will be a 17 minute break in the day at the high school and we will be emphasizing that we need to respect all perspectives. Um, we're expecting that the other schools, that it'll just be business as usual, but we will prepare for all scenarios. And I'll be drafting a communication by the end of the week for parents and staff. And also just, uh, you know, I think the recent um, shooting in Florida has just made us all really more aware of like security. Uh, I think we do a really good job in this district. We have a safety committee, but I will be kind of taking a tour of the district and meeting with Ray Grogan and Mike McManus, who heads up our safety committee, and Dennis, to just uh, see if there are any immediate safety concerns that we need to address, either this year or, or plan in next year's budget. And then Cynthia and I have completed two of our three question answer sessions with community members and parents. And although attendance has been a little bit sparse, uh, we've had very robust conversations with the people who have attended on a variety of topics. We've talked about math, proficiency, class size, college prep, music, safety. And so I just want to encourage people to come out for the last remaining dessert with the superintendent. We'll be on Thursday, March 22nd at Pownell Elementary Library from 6 to 7. All are invited to attend. And then also just a reminder to the board that you're invited to attend the Tri-Town Leadership Meeting at the Freeport Community Center tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. And then finally, I'm reporting to the board the, the following two employees have given notice of their retirement at the end of the year. Linda Davenport, retiring from Mass Landing from the position of school nutrition specialist. And Melinda Dole, retiring from Freeport High School from our ed tech position. And we wanna thank these two individuals for their years of service to the district. And that concludes my report. Very good report. Sorry, I tried to jump in. <laughs> Quite so all. now it's Michelle's turn. <laughs> all right, if you will take out your purple sheets. Not much has changed from the prior month. Um, we should be, we should have like 42% left. We're at closer to 46%. So that means that we're doing well. <laughs> So I, I really like that. Um, no surprises again. Things are going well. Um, we did have one issue that came up, the, uh, the condenser unit at Durham, thank you, at Durham um, needed to be repaired. So we, were, we had to uh, pull that out of funds to repair it. So nothing that was, you know, I think it was 8,000? Six thousand dollars. So sorry, because the bill hasn't come through yet, so I didn't know the price. But we did know that it, we had the funds to pay for it. So uh, that was the, the only issue that's come up recently. We have now for the HR office, we have the um, uh, online uh, enrollment for applications. It's going very well. I think the principals are okay with it. <laughs> I think they're liking it. Um, we've, we're getting feedback. Of course, it's the first season for it, so things may, might change a little bit, but we're definitely getting a lot of applications this way. So, and it's filtering much quicker than hand paperwork. So, um, I think that's it. I don't think there's anything else to report. Any questions for Michelle? Sarah. I'm just curious, Michelle, is the, is the condenser unit part of the, the heat pump? Sorry, it was the refrigerant system for the uh, in the kitchen. Ah, great. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Michelle. Awesome. 
All right, unfinished business workshop budget review. We are going to start with Pownell Elementary School and Lisa Demick. Good evening. Oh, I guess I'm a little taller than Michelle. <laughs> I don't get to say that often, so thank you. <laughs> um, so we, we had a very um, collaborative process this year. I'm sure Becky has shared with you around how we sort of all got together to kind of decide sort of what our priorities were. And and for me, the, the big pla biggest place I was sort of putting my support was around the maintenance. So it's not really in under PES, but, um, you know, I, I think this district really takes pride and making sure that we're sort of staying ahead of um, maintenance and um, and so um, my big priority was to make sure that that fifty thousand dollars which we keep trying to put in the budget for Dennis gets to stay in this year so um, so that was a big the biggest change uh, or the biggest place that I was putting my support you may notice that the other buildings were um, all working to update their um, their ed techs from 30 hours to 32 and a half and you may wonder why PES was left off of that and that's because where we only have one person in our kitchen um, our ed ed tech does two and a half hours of lunch clerk time already so we didn't in order for that person to be there for the whole day we already have those two and a half hours so that's why you don't see that on my budget um, I'm happy to report that um, the all day K that you supported last year is going beautifully 73% um, of mrs. Hardy's kids have already are already working on the end of the year target and um, just the time in the day to do some of those things that were sort of um, cut out when she was trying to do a full curriculum in a half day have been just fun to see. I watched them in the gym on Monday. They were doing a science unit on push and pull on scooters. And, you know, just having that time, you know, it's just been a really happy experience for kids. So I think, you know, some some folks in, in Pownell had some questions around, you know, will it be too much for the kids? Will it be um, developmentally appropriate? And I can say without a doubt that it absolutely is so um, so that's those that kind of concludes my requests any questions Allie. hi hi um, so I wanted to ask you if you have any projected wait list for pre-k uh, um, not yet. Right now we're at 13, but um, we're, we're watching it closely because usually, um, you know, it's we get a number of kids after um, the parent information night, and so our parent information night is March 21st, and we already have 13 kids that have um, signed up for 16 slots. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I have another quick question, and this is: Could you elaborate a little bit on? Yeah, uh, the RTI point two that you guys discussed, mm -hmm. and why would that be needed? So, so last year, so one of the things that we're working to do is to get our most expert people with our, you know, our striving students. And so last year, um, I went from having. Um, two full-time ed techs, one that did, um, Kim Ordway, that did part um, pre-K, and then the other ha half of her job was RTI, and Jennifer Winkler, whose whole job was RTI. Well, Jennifer we was a wonderful score for us because she was a certified teacher, and so um, I had the opportunity last year to sort of trade in her hours for a half-time teacher so I was just trying to kind of get back to the amount of face time that we had when we had um, a full-time person in that role um, we're finding it challenging it's interesting um, it, it's hard to be efficient in our school when it comes to RTI support because we have um, you know seven grade levels but 
small numbers. So oftentimes they're working with one or two students um, because of the grade level and the need. Um, but that makes the time go very quickly. So um, that was why I asked for that additional time just to try and sort of incrementally support it. Another thing we're finding is that um, we're having students where we've done a really nice job of supporting them. So if they've gone through the special ed process, they aren't qualifying for special ed because like on nationally sort of normed tests, they're coming out within the average range. But when you compare them to district standards and and um, and state standards, they're still kids that that we want to um, support. You know, with that idea that we want to make sure that we're not waiting until high school to make sure everyone's proficient. We're trying to really make that proactive. And I'd love to see us able to sort of service. Um, more of those kids along the way. Um, new students coming into the school is another population that we find, um, you know, some do great and they 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 slip right in and others um, really would benefit from a boost and right now the classroom teachers are doing that. Um, and so, you know, there it it's a place where I'll be continuing to ask for more support. <laughs> yep. All right. Okay. Any other questions for Lisa? All right, thank you. Uh, Mass Landing School, Emily Grimm. Um, good evening. So there are three uh, areas of the proposed budget which directly reflect Mass Landing School needs. Uh, the first surrounds uh, the addition of regular ed social work time. So currently, uh, Julie and I share a .6 social worker, um, and she is designated primarily for special education purposes. So occasionally we will pull her into other roles, but right now we don't have any time that's allocated specifically to support kids um, who aren't identified for special ed but would uh, benefit from some additional support. Um, and so. Julie will speak to this as well, but this role is really designed primarily to do two things. A, to provide services directly to kids on building skill that's relevant to their ability to function well in a school environment. Um, so we often have kids who have behaviors that impede their ability to be successful in the classroom, um, and we're trying to teach into those skills in the same way we're trying to teach them reading, writing, math, science. Um, but this is a, an avenue to have somebody be focused specifically on that skill development. And what we found too is that that role is most effective when it can support the transfer, not just of that skill in a conference room setting, you know, a, a social worker and a student, but the social worker who has adequate time to push in on the transfer of that skill to the classroom. And I'd say that's right now where we feel the pain point is even when we're able to pull our social worker to work with a regular ed student, they might be meeting with the student 30 minutes a week but there's not the capacity for that social worker to push in and support the transfer of the skill in the setting that's most important, which is the classroom. Um, and then the other piece that that social worker would do would be supporting teachers in the development and implementation of behavior support plans. So if we're thinking about developing skills in kids, a, a support plan is designed to do just that and to support the classroom teacher in understanding how what they're doing um, can support the development of the student's behavior as well and providing that level um, of expertise, which exceeds my expertise, Julie may agree sometimes <laughs> as well, um, that it's nice to have somebody who's got a really focused lens um, on skill development as it relates to behavior. Um, the second piece is just a request um, We've talked about shifts with EdTech hours and then EdTech 2 to EdTech 3. One of our special ed um, EdTechs is in a role that really lends itself um, to having planning time and um, it's just a request essentially to enable that that role for her to go from an EdTech 2 to an EdTech 3. And then there's one additional request that isn't reflected on this document, which is the addition of a teacher to next year's fifth grade cohort, um, which you'll see on here is 91. Um, right now, actually, we continue our enrollment increase at Mass Landing, so we were at 91 when I did this document. I have two additional students that are projected to join us, and then one that I know is taking a, is doing a, a travel abroad experience um, for the fifth grade year. So will lose one. So right now we're actually looking at 92, which at five um, 
teachers would bring us to class sizes of 18 and 19. Um, and Becky and I have talked long and hard about this class over the course probably of the last three months and looking at the needs of the core of this cohort, which also has a really large special ed cluster um, and would benefit um, from this additional teacher to both um, reduce the class size but ensure that given the needs of the kids in those classes um, that all kids are being served well. So questions? So will that point to regular education social work? It sounds like it's a regular education social worker, but they're also supporting special ed. Yeah, so right, the way that the, um, the ask is de detailed in here is essentially to take a current social work position, which is point six, and make it into a full-time position. We've had some dialogue about whether that's the approach to take or it's more effective to hire somebody specifically to serve in this regular education capacity social work role versus a special ed um, social work role. So I think that will continue to be a topic of conversation in terms of how to be most strategic um, in the hiring and thinking about, you know, Julie and I are in very regular communication, both about the needs in her building, kind of what's coming, what we've seen um, with some enrollment shifts this year, um, because some of these needs too are coming out from kids that, you know, we, Mass Landing has been excited to have 41 kids join us this year. Um, and with any 40 kids, you get some with needs, right? And we want to make sure that um, we have the capacity to respond to that. So is this request kind of a, a compromise and you're, you're still going to be needing to beef up your attention to that population? So, so the request Julie and I had truly was to take that current role and to make it a full-time um, position. Um, that said, I think one of the things that's been a topic between Julie and myself and that we've brought Becky into is in the event that that need shifts, then with a 1.0 role, it's in some ways you're almost more limited, right? Because then you're looking at, okay, do you create a point three role, in which case it's very hard to hire for, you don't have continuity. One of the things Julie and I really appreciate now about the shared position is its continuity for kids. So I have, you know, I can talk to our social worker about a fifth grader who she's known for several years. Um, and so looking at all those positions, and sometimes kids that are in regular ed become kids in special ed, and is it desirable to have one person in that role and continuity as kids may ebb and flow into and out of special ed. So there are a lot of pros and cons. Like I said, we're in dialogue. Becky's chuckling because Monday I proposed this very dilemma to her. It's like, how can we be most strategic about that addition? But the ask was, you know, when Julie and I sat down and put our heads together on, on the needs we're seeing that aren't met, you know, when we're making the list of kids, um, this was our thinking, that this would enable us to have a person across both buildings. It enables us to always pick up the phone and say, hey, Julie, it's one of those days. Can I have so-and-so? And right now, we can't do that. We have lots of time where there, there isn't a fallback. And so about the social worker. This would be a new position that's point four shared between the two schools. It's not adding time to existing social workers. So that's a decision that hasn't, that, so the decision um, that when we created the proposal, the thinking was to have one person be that 1.0 position and to repost, because this is a slightly different job than the special ed social work position, encourage our current social worker to apply for that position. As we co continue to think about what's going to best serve both buildings, I, I can't say that we've, and Julie can speak to this as well, that, that I'm certain that that's the best path. I think it very well may be, and like I said, I brought this to Becky Monday morning when um, we have had one of our regular meetings that the thinking may be to actually post it separately. Um, there are pros and cons to both. Do you think it would, if you chose the latter and sort of split the position, keep the point six and add a point four, do you think it would be a struggle to find someone who's willing to take a point four? So the beauty of social work um, is actually we've, our experience has been the opposite. So our current social worker, for example, um, is in private practice, as are many school social workers. and. Um, a part-time position is actually quite valuable because social workers who specialize in working with school-age kids often can't work during the school day um, or not work a full day because the kids they're servicing. We feel this pain sometimes too where families are pulling kids to be serviced 
during school hours. Um, so unlike a teaching position where I'd say yes, you know, there's that there's a strong push to do a 1.0 because your applicant pool is going to be much more robust. I feel less strongly about that. In fact, I feel like it may actually serve us um, better to have a a true like a 0.6 and a 0.4, 0.5 um, because. Um, there are people who are professionals but want either to be in a school setting for part of the day, um, to remain close that way, who are looking for benefits. That's another driver sometimes at this, and it's a nice balance to private practice work. That's great. It's good to have that flexibility. <coughs> Kelly? So I'm not exactly clear about the um, change of the EdTech 2 to the EdTech 3. Are you basically reallocating a special ed at tech two to regular? No, it's a, it, we, had this, <laughs> yeah. we had this we had this this that. insight right <laughs> literally thirty minutes ago that it so it's noted on the bottom of here on the the right hand box change one at tech two role to an ed tech three role, but it wasn't clarified that that's a special ed ed tech. So we have three special ed ed techs. Um, that, so this is really an instructional support ask more than a. And then the other question I had about edtechs was the um, uh, conversation you guys had about adding an edtech three to regular ed. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, there, partic I would say particularly in math, um, there are occasionally needs that come up where kids benefit from additional support. Lisa spoke um, a moment ago to to our shift um, in some buildings, and mass landing has been one of them, where the thinking has been, how do we put the very um, you know, the, or our staff with the deepest level of expertise in a content area with the kids who need the most support or most of need of, of, of growth to get to proficiency. Um, and so we shifted away from a model that was really looking at having an ed tech who might push in and support a classroom of, of kids or pull out. Um, you know, in a perfect world, if resources were not, were not a, uh, you know, were unlimited, would we have some additional adults in the building to enable that kind of fluid support? Yes. That said, I think for our very neediest kids, when I look at the model right now, that those kids who are identified as you know not making years worth of growth, who are well below um, where we want them to be, that they get to be with a certified teacher for their support. To me, that's a, a more effective model. Um, and particularly when I look at the requests that I know you've already heard from some of the administrators earlier this month and from those that are here tonight, I feel like these are more instructionally impactful than a model of having an additional adult in a classroom. And I, I think in our district, by and large, that model no longer exists. This, this kind of just extra hands model is kind of what I think of it as. That our ed techs, who are regular ed techs, are really used for pullout support. Um, and right now we have, so we have three folks who um, two of which are part-time support um, those interventions, and it's a, it's a truly a pull-out model where kids are getting pulled for supplemental instruction. So follow up in the absence of this, how are you going to service the needs of those math students who are not yeah, so last year you may recall, so Gail Wolotsky, um, who is formerly a fourth grade teacher and now doing STEM um, and intervention, is filling a part of that math um, role. The other thing we've done this year is in our third and fourth grades, we have a lift block, which uh, is a time, 30 minutes during the day when kids are um, sorted by need. And that has enabled us to better focus too on the kind of lifting the level of those kids because what ends up happening is those kids end up being in a group of um, eight students usually. It's been a smaller group. Um, and so they're getting some targeted focus um, during those times as well. And again, it's consistent with having a classroom teacher um, with them. So that's been another way we've been able to provide support that responds to those kids. Is that sufficient? Because you have that yes. model now and this still showed up. Yeah, I do believe it's, it is um, working to reach those kids. I'll have the, you know, in a few months we'll have the data to talk about it in more depth. Okay, thank you. More street school, Miss Nickerson. So, um, first of all, I want to start by saying thank you. I feel as I look at what we've had 
um, added to our school over the last two budget cycles. Um, you know, we increased our guidance time. We shifted from an ed tech in our library to more librarian time. Last year, I've actually just realized I missed kind of an important thing that we had last year. So we added our full-time RTI math teacher last year, which has been a really big asset. Um, Asia Derek moved from being a special ed teacher into the RTI role and as she defined as her dream job and she's really hit the ground running and has done amazing things um, to really support needs for students and we're catching them early and filling early developmental gaps in kind of math um, development. Um, but what's missing on that list of things that we had in last year's budget is a 0.6 pre-K teacher and ed tech to go with it. So that was a big thing for us last year to expand our pre-K offerings. Um, and we now have 48 students in our pre-K, which has been a really great um, addition to our school. Um, and we're catching those students early and we we kind of have a really good sense of the majority of our kindergartners who will be coming up next year so like we, we feel like we've got that information ahead of time um, and so Emily spoke to most of the ask around the social work and I'll just add kind of one other piece is you know asking for the social work under regular ed is is in some way protecting that time because changing needs of special ed will walk through the door and they will take priority. So even if, um, like last year, I had 0.6 uh, social work time in our building, so we were able to use her um, to support some regular ed needs, but, but this year all of her time is taken up with uh, special ed because the needs have changed and, and we're not able to access her to support those students who need more intensive um, support. So our guidance counselor, and I kind of tag team around some of those things, but then that's when the need becomes more intense, you know, something else gets lost in its place. So, you know, the real ask is around it being protected time for regular ed for those, those students who are not qualifying for special ed, but they still have those lagging skills that is kind of getting in the way of their learning. Um, and then my other ask is around increasing one of our regular ed techs to from an ed tech two to an ed tech three my third ed tech isn't able to to shift to an ed tech three so that's the only reason why it wasn't requested to change her as well and then to increase their hours from 30 hours to 32.5 just so that we have more flexibility in the day we have many more little kids moving at vulnerable times and so just to be able to have um, them all there at arrival and dismissal. Right now they're either there at one or the other um, and then they have more flexibility around just communication with teachers so they're often either arriving late once teachers are already in classrooms and in the flow with students or they're leaving before the end of the school day just of where their hours are, are flexed. Um, and then when we talked as as an administrative team about where the supports are across buildings. Um, I have a 15 hour ed tech that um, with the addition of the hours to the three that right now the, the structure is um, each grade level has an ed tech assigned to them for support and that looks different depending on what the need is of students and we've created it so that it's it fluctuates so the RTI support and it might be behavior or it might be math or reading or writing just depending what needs of students are um, and I think it's just it's more efficient that we add to the those three ed techs than um, the 15 hours that that other ed tech is using so that ended up becoming a little bit of a surplus when we gained the librarian we didn't lose that ed tech time that that ed tech was so we didn't trade off one at that time so and so that's why that kind of feels like it's something we can give back um, to share the support elsewhere any questions How many kids on your pre-K waitlist? Uh, so or projected? So I don't have anyone on the waitlist. So I have 36 on the list for 48 spots at this point. We have our information night tomorrow night, which might um, generate some more interest. So that so April 1st is kind of our um, the point which we suggest that anything after that we would um, need a lot. So I have 12 more spots. Long story short. <laughs> That's good. <laughs>
I like to hear that. <laughs> and one more question. Uh, I understand the logic behind reducing the 15 hours mm -hmm. for the attack. Um, but there's also a conversation, or you guys had a conversation, requesting uh, 0.4 EdTech 3 for Moore Street. So how does that work? That um, we see a reduction on one sheet, and then the other sheet says that you would like to have more EdTech. Oh, so that goes with the pre-K oh, teacher. So okay. it would be if we expanded pre-K to one more session, okay. then the EdTech has to go with pre-K right. and right. doesn't go anywhere else. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. So I, I had one question. Um, as it relates to the changing of the EdTech 2 to a 3, mm -hmm. um, I understand that your other EdTech right now doesn't have the credentialing mm -hmm. or whatever to go from 2 to 3. Um, People change roles throughout the year. I mean, does it make sense to put that role at EdTech 3 so you have flexibility if you, one, they either become able to be, I, I don't know, I mean, and, or if someone were to leave and it would give you the flexibility to hire someone at the level that you would like them to be at? I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's a huge, I think, cost difference, but I think it might be prudent to budget it that way. I don't know. Just a thought. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> we have the flexibility, I think, through turnover savings and things like that, that if that happened, we would be able to do that. And so that, is our, that is our goal, to not be hiring new ed tech ones and twos because there's just so much more flexibility with the three that that was my thought was like you know if we have it in there as a two does that mean we couldn't hire a three if we wanted to but you're saying we could correct okay and you know i will say because i'm sure some of our ed tech ones and twos if they're hearing this are, are squirming some of our greatest ed techs are ed techs ones and twos and there have been districts that i've seen that have said we'll give you three years or something to get credentialed or you're going to you know lose your job we have no interest in doing that because we value the people we have but we also know that when we're hiring new that we want to go to threes okay perfect just want to provide that flexibility if yeah. the opportunity arose all right um, community programs. So I think you're doing your budget and your department report, David, because we bumped you. But we didn't give you any more time, I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> you got the same amount of time as everybody else. It was a surprise. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, you have everything. What would you like to know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, I mean, I don't even. Where would you like to start? Should we go to the budget, the two-page budget thing? Okay. Um, so, um, you know, primarily, um, you know, to sum it up, we're asking for a $9,000 increase to the adult ed budget and everything else to will be covered either through um, um, uh, user fees or undesignated fund balance. Um, and um, um, our primary goals are to, uh, with that 9000 it's six, it's um, $6,500 towards um, instruction costs for um, increasing advising um, and um, time for um, career pathways development in our um, learning lab for teacher time and also an additional $2,500 for professional development to cover a lot of the changes that are uh, that have, are being brought upon us right now in adult ed. So that's the extent of the of the um, budget request. So David, the chart that we have here with the budget request. Correct. So the staffing changes; those will be funded by your own budget. You're not requesting. No, no, no. That's the that's the adult ed changes. So, okay. That's where the the additional nine thousand dollars. That is the same. Yes. Thing. Okay. Yes. And um, you know the other. Um, part to put in there is that whenever you know we are not a um, 
we're not like the rest of the school budget where um, we get a, a, a state um, we, we're not part of, of that um, um, calculation for the from the DOE so ours is expense based and it lags three years so um, you know we're based on what we actually spend and um, so we look at what our needs are based on the programming and then um, eventually down you know three years from now the state gives us money back which is supposed to be um, um, about seven anywhere from 70 to 75 percent we've been getting half of that so we get about 30 you know 35 to 37 percent of, of what we're supposed to get so but so it does come back a part of it does come back roughly about a third of what we expend so it, you know by going up 9,000 we will see an increase in our uh, state subsidy as well so they'll be kicking in part of that and for folks that need a reminder or are new to the board um, community community and adult ed sort of runs as its own what is it called enterprise, enterprise fund, fund. Yeah. so it sort of has its own P&L and its own income sources um, and then from the overall budget we typically um, allocate I don't know a hundred to one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars a year to help subsidize those um, those activities um, but it's not you know when you look at all these uh, at his budget and costs those aren't necessarily numbers you'll follow over and find on the green sheet the purple whatever color are she right now <laughs> purple Correct. from from Michelle so um, similar to the nutrition program which we'll hear about next right. also an enterprise fund so it's a little bit different in terms of the financial piece of it so I uh, just wanted to throw that out there for folks if, right for what it's worth yeah yeah you'll you'll on the warrant what you actually see is the total cost of adult and community education which is in this budget is about 230 I think it's about 235,000 um, and then the local contribution is what we're asking in as far as local tax dollars that we're asking for 112 and the overall budget for community programs also includes preschool before after care um, um, the facilities oversight the um, teen center and the rec department for the three towns so the total budgets over nine hundred thousand So any increase we would see in the local contribution goes directly to the adult ed goes portion Goes directly of the to the adult ed, yes. Yep. So um, David, the second page, the yes. last paragraph, describes the changes at Laugh and Learn in enrollment. And at one point it says, well, our average daily registration has decreased by half a day. Does Correct. that mean that you only have 50% of the enrollment that you used to have? for Life and Learn? No, I'm sorry. So um, I'm a statistician. I, lo I love numbers. So I calculate everything. And basically what I've done is try to determine the average um, use for the students. So we have 128 students. Roughly the, um, those 128 students come about 3.75 average days per week. Okay. Last year we were about 4.25. Okay. So, and the reduction there is because of the increase. So that reduces our income, and the reduction there is because of the in the addition of pre-K at Moore Street. So, and we lost a classroom right before school starts because this still started because of you know as Julie says some of the changes in in special ed they needed a classroom they they got our second classroom so so we're at capacity right now we feel good about the program um, we'd like to you know have an opportunity to be able to service all the students that, that are you know requesting but we just don't have any room anywhere so 
So what have you done to offset the loss in revenue from the enrollment? We've drop? reduced staff. You have reduced staff? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Any other questions for David? Thank you. Okay. Did you good want job. nothing about the program? Well, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> we, we, did, we opened the floor for you if you wanted to share it. So I, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, if anybody has any questions, you can just email me. Or do you want to go through it? Or is it okay? Okay, good. Yeah, no, I think it's good. Okay. Perfect. Appreciate it. We know where to find you. Yep. <laughs> All right, nutrition. Aaron Dow. <laughs> Welcome, Aaron. I think this is the first time it that is. you've spoken for the whole board. It is. And Thank if you, you needed to me. sit because you have crutches, we could figure out a way to make that happen. Now it's you. my physical therapist says that it's good to stand for okay, brief good. periods of time. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> It was a long walk from the, that parking lot, though, I will say. <laughs> so um, I feel really good about where the nutrition program is right now, um, but I didn't feel so good about it when I came here. <laughs> um, you know, there were several issues that the program was facing. The, it was over budget, um, but more importantly to me, because I'm a food person, and I also have kids, and I've been doing this job for a while now in another district, is the perception of the program itself, just the whole vibe of it, including the food, the menu, it just wasn't up to par. And I heard that from parents, I heard it from students, I heard it from my own staff. Um, so that was the first priority that we were gonna do, is we were gonna fix that problem. Um, and so, you know, one of the complaints was there was a conspicuous absence of fruits and vegetables, well, fresh fruits and vegetables, and so at our first staff meeting I told my staff, go nuts, spend anything you want, vegetables are cheap, let's figure it out. And sure enough, within two or three weeks, we saw a huge jump in numbers, not just among students, not just amongst students, but also amongst staff as well. And this is an important thing for us because when staff comes in and they're engaged with the program, that starts to rub off on the students as well. Um, so then we started tweaking the menus a little bit, trying to work towards a menu cycle that is starting to incorporate more home-cooked or homemade type meals, trying to reduce our reliance upon processed foods. Um, again, continuing to increase the quality of the the um, fruits and vegetables that we were serving, looking at local partnerships to try to bring that to uh, another part of the circle. Um, and that's been going great too. Primarily we've been focused on doing that at the middle and high school levels because in my opinion they're the ones that also serve as role models for the younger siblings who are the next generation of customers. Uh, it's also our last chance to get them to participate in the program as they're transitioning out of high school. Um, and so at the high school we've done almost every day there's a homemade home style entree. We have smoothies and parf yogurt parfaits and all kinds of things that are really boosting participation to the point where participation at lunchtime um, at the high school is up well over 20 percent in four months where uh, all I'm talking about is September to December compared to last year at this time that's amazing um, at the elementary school level it's a little more tough they're pickier uh, they're more set in their ways um, and their the participation at both breakfast and lunch um, across the elementary grades was very low. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was just make sure that I was creating a predictable menu of accessible foods that weren't terribly challenging so that they could just feel comfortable with the program again. Now that that's starting to pick up momentum as well, now we're starting to work on introducing some more of the home cooked meals there. Now a lot of these kids have never seen meatloaf before or, or Asian chicken and rice bowls um, but we're starting to put these things on the menu because the more times we introduce them to them, the more likely they're going to accept them. And the earlier we do it, the more likely they'll eat it all the way through school. Um, so district-wide right now, breakfast participation is holding steady. That's not a surprising thing. And by steady, I mean it's low. 
um, really low. Um, but there are a couple of factors with that. We have a very low free reduced percentage. So there isn't a critical enough mass of free and reduced children to enable us at this point anyway to implement like a universal free breakfast program because the money's just not there with a low uh, participation. I think bell schedules may have something to do with it, but I haven't been here long enough to, to really analyze that. Um, but I am working with the middle school right now um, and we're looking at an alternative breakfast service um, where we would have a mobile cart, which has been done before, um, and, and it didn't help. But um, I work very closely with the Department of Education because they really mentored me as I became a new director at my previous district. And one of, uh, is actually the woman who came and did the administrative review here last year, so she's very familiar with the program, and she said, call it a snack cart. And I said, well, you can do that? She said, absolutely, call it a snack cart. You still offer the same things, but it's just a different thing. And that makes a big difference to a sixth grader or a seventh grader. Yeah. So we're looking into that. I have, um, you know, I have some paperwork that I need to do, uh, the principals, and I have been talking as long, along with my staff, and we'll see how it goes. We're not going to make any purchases or do anything crazy, but we'd like to see what we can do maybe in that one scenario. Because if we can make it work with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, we can work, make it work with kindergarten or pre-K through five. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, as I mentioned, RSU 5 has a low free and reduced percentage, so one of the ways that directors can look at what the perception is of food is how many of those kids who eat the food for free are eating the food. And it was very clear really quickly that free and reduced percentage of participation in both the breakfast and lunch program were very low. So, um, so I ran some numbers based on the um, DOE reports and in four months Freeport High School free and reduced percentage at breakfast is up 12 percent, at middle school 14 percent, Moore Street 10 percent, Mass Landing 29 percent, Durham Community School 15 percent and Pownall 12 percent but you know when you only have a hundred kids that's that's a big number. Um, <clears throat> and so, so we're seeing a, a you know a better participation among these students, and then we're also seeing a correlation, correlating increase in general participation, just not this high. But again, if the kids that are not paying for it are eating it, that's another mass of students that are accessing our program, and they're the most critical ones in term financially because we get a much higher state subs subsidy reimbursement for any of those meals that we serve. So this is more good news. Um, I did a little analysis of the budget um, in terms of expenses and income over the last three years. I looked at September through December again because that's what I had the data for at the time I was preparing this report. Um, so at the end of fiscal year 17, um, this program had $313,000 plus in expenses for that four months. This year we were at $285,000. Uh, we had gross receipts in fiscal year 17 for the first four months of, of our operating time of $173,000 and at this point we're up to $210,000. Now, none of those numbers include any of the local appropriation money that's coming in, some of which is going specifically to general support of the program and the remainder of it uh, that was allocated at the end of last year for some debt reduction. So when we look at these numbers in total, what we see is that we're, we've cut expenses and we've raised income to the point where a good chunk of the total local appropriation can be applied towards the debt reduction and, and perhaps accelerate it. So um, in terms of what we're looking for for next year, um, we want to just continue the momentum. If we can get another 4% increase district-wide in lunch, that means we've done 8% in two years, and that would be amazing. 
Um, we want to continue to foster the increased participation among staff members because those meals, um, because they have to be profitable, um, and they don't, we don't get subsidized for them, they help for the general support of the program as well. We're increasing our catering operations, which are profitable at this point too, so that's helping to kind of boost the income. Um, and it's been great. We've been able to do a bunch of meetings for, for Becky. We've done some class parties, um, class parties for teachers as opposed to them going and getting Domino's. They're coming to us and getting pizzas, whole, you know, whole grain, um, low fat pizzas. Um, so that's really good news for us. And it also helps my staff get some extra hours. And because by law our catering operations have to be profitable, that those hours are paid for by the income from every invoice that we do. Um, and then, you know, the overarching goal is to just do the best that we can for our students in the most cost neutral way to the taxpayers of these communities as possible. And I think that we're on the right track. I'm, I'm really anxious to be settled in enough to be able to do what I really like to do, which is not be in my office and figuring out how all of this works here, but to get into the kitchens and start cooking and subbing and, and doing those kinds of things because the staff has been so welcoming and so dedicated and they took over the food ordering for this year, which the previous two directors did all of the ordering for the food for all of the districts. And it's not that I had a problem doing the work, I just, I'm not the boss of those kitchens. So I said, take it over, we had training, let's see how they did, and they've been amazing. And I'm convinced that some of it is because all of them are so in tune to what they have going on, what they have planned, what they're gonna have left over, that they're the best ones to do it. So I really give a lot of kudos to them for all of the help that they've been. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. First of all, I would say congratulations. I mean, this is a huge turnaround from what we've seen year Thanks. to year. So thank you very much for that. So, Jen. Yeah, I think it's great. And I, I just, you know, a little story to enhance what you said is I have a 16 year old who's a sophomore who had never had a hot lunch until this year. And there's something about the burgers apparently that they serve here that I haven't had to make lunch, make lunch for a while. So awesome. I, I think that says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the the crazy thing is, you know, when, when I was in high school, we had memes that were making us food, and they were making homemade bread and butter and things like that, and these days, kids are so food savvy, and, and so we can, we're starting to put Thai food and Mediterranean food and stuff in there, and, and they're like, well, that's so 2012, you know, <laughs> they, they want sushi, and... Yeah. That will be a cash purchase. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I just want to echo how great it is to hear all the improvements and advances that you've made. So thank you for that. Thank you. And then on the back side of your yellow page, mm -hmm. uh, there are three um, items which are FY19 request and budget and need, but they're not included here in your little table so oh I thought the table was just for employee for employee increases oh, okay. it is so these are requests okay. to the RSU 5 budget these are not coming out of your own budget even though they're not here I'm not sure I understand okay uh, basically everything listed on the yellow sheet yep as a request is a request for the district budget correct Yep, nutrition. Michelle, could you go to the... Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to <laughs> PTSD. Uh, so, um, it's, it's uh, um, this is the, another enterprise fund. So it's just like the adult ed program. So even though the adult ed program is actually more than the 112 that we're going to give, her budget is actually more than what we're giving for local appropriations. So this, these asks went into her budget and then we're appropriating what couldn't be covered by revenue. So this is what couldn't be covered by the revenue for the no, nutrition okay. budget? No. No. That's, that's in her total budget. Okay. So that's not in her total budget. Okay. Not sure I have that totally clear yet. So I 
think her. I'm total sorry, I'm budget, being a little. No, thick. no, no, it's okay. I think her total budget is eight hundred and some odd thousand dollars, and you guys are funding about two hundred thousand of it, two hundred thirty-seven thousand okay. of it. Okay. So that went into her eight thousand, eight hundred thousand budget, and then you what? And she could only make revenue of about six hundred thousand. So we're covering the other two hundred. Okay. What's yes? Okay. <laughs> now I get it. <laughs> okay. And those are pro projected revenues for next year. Correct. So we did we did bump up our revenue projections for next year based on the um, performance of the program up until the point that we had started working on the budget. And um, we tweaked that again. So so it's the increases that we um, projected in the revenues were proportional to what we had seen in increases. Over, you know, for the first few months of the year. Do you have a question, Kate? Yeah, it was for Michelle, actually. Um, so what is our, um, the amount that we're putting into nutrition, is that increasing at all this year? As it compared to last year? Yeah. Um, yes, because I think, because if you take last year's and subtract out 111,000 that we added towards the budget, I think it's still a little bit less than what we're putting in this year. So, but not by a lot. I mean, it's like from 230 to 237. It's not a huge jump. So last year we were covering a gap. We yeah. were trying to fill in the gap above and beyond did. what we knew we were going to have to subsidize, <laughs> and it was bigger, right? So yes. we were filling in some of that gap. And um, so my question is, is how do we get rid of the rest of that gap because it does still sound like there is a gap between revenues and, and expenses. So uh, I don't know how we make up that other 111 we didn't do, or 110 or whatever it was last year, um, if we're still negative. So I, mean, I don't less think we'll negative? Be, so I don't think we'll be negative. I think we're going to end up being positive. And it'll, it's not by much this year. It's by like So when you say positive, you're including the money that the taxpayers are putting towards it? Yes, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. But subtracting out the additional money that they put in towards debt reduction. That's correct. Yeah. So the additional money. So if you take the 330, I can't remember the exact amount, but it's 300 and some odd thousand dollars. Of that, 111 right. was for the additional. If you take that away, we're still going to be positive in this year, which we had not been in prior years. Okay. Right. Because the hole was getting bigger. The hole was getting bigger. Yeah. So that, that what will change is over time, we're hoping that that will decrease. The amount that the local contribution will be will decrease over time. But also at the same time, we're making sure that twenty to 40000 of it is paying off prior debt. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yes. Is it me or? Um, maybe both. I don't know. I don't okay. know if either of you have the answer to this. But what is, what is the? <laughs> I thought I'd give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> Way to um, coach the question. <laughs> right. What is the ideal, like, in a perfect school district where there's lots of revenue from catering and, you know, participation? I mean, what is, is there, could there be a scenario where one day the, R, the RSU board no, wouldn't okay, put that. any money towards it? If, or is that, like, what, what are we trying to shoot? Like, what's a reasonable what's goal? Like, what are yeah. we trying to do? I mean, obviously, it's to not be, you know, lose that's money, a, but I mean... That's is a it local 200? choice. Is it 100? Is it, you know, 50,000? What are we talking about? The, the gold standard for school nutrition directors in the National School and Breakfast Lunch Program is to be able to operate at zero, at nonprofit, by the end of the year, using only revenues that are coming in from cash sales to paid students and adults and state subsidy payments for free and reduced kids. That doesn't really generally happen. Mm -hmm. Because um, in a district like Auburn or Lewiston, that can absolutely happen because they have 89 or 95 percent free and reduced. Or they're up to the point where they can claim the entire district, you know, at a higher eligibility rate. Mm -hmm. We're never going, I don't think these communities are ever going to get there. So you, you decide as a community w what you want to be. We have a large number of paid students. We also have a large number of, of accounts that remain unpaid. And so, you know, we, ha we just have to kind of figure out where the balance is. Um, but I think that 
what what I'm seeing right now is an increase in the free and reduced participation for breakfast and lunch. I'm seeing an increase in paid and adults. So that's all good momentum. But to answer your question specifically, it's a local decision what kind of meal program they want to run. So that's where you decide how much money you want to put in. If we want to have high paid school nutrition staff that are well paid for what they do, that might not be covered entirely by cash sales and subsidies. So we might, as a district, decide that we want to put some money in to support higher wages or better benefits for its cafeteria workers. I don't know. There are all kinds of ways to look at it. So you're not going to give me a number? <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I mean, it's impossible. It's Somewhere impossible between budget. zero and 237. <laughs> the, my goal is always is, is to, like I said at the end of, uh, of the report that I put, is to provide the maximum benefit consistent with the district's priorities, whatever those are or however they evolve, with the least impact on taxpayer, the, you know, the taxpayers of these communities. So ideally for me, I can walk in here in two years or five years or eight years and say, guess what? You can take all your money and you can get some more ed techs and, and that would be ideal because then I would be a success, you know? I would have made it work. Um, again, with this demographic, I can't picture myself ever coming back here, but I'm going to keep trying and not asking for money, but I'll keep trying. <laughs> I don't think you need to tie your success strictly to that, because I think you can say well, no, it's been I, extremely I, I, successful. I simplified it a little bit. Yeah. But. I think your success has been amazing this year, because frankly, personally, I thought it would take a long time to increase enrollment just by changing the menu. I thought people would take, you know, a whole year, two years, three years to notice the change and actually enroll. Yep. So I'm amazed that you've been able to do this and I'm so um, impressed that your choices have been right spot on in recognizing what the community wants and, and what they're, um, I mean, you know, what they expect from thank the you. nutrition program. Thanks. So thank you so much and if you can do that and in addition get us out of the hole, that's wonderful. <laughs> so thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, do you have a target for what you'd like to see participation levels at at each school? Uh, um, well, I, I'm kind of, I'm spoiled because uh, in my previous district in Winthrop, we had just a high enough free and reduced percentage to have universal breakfast. We were serving 70% of our students district-wide breakfast every day. Um, I don't, again, I don't think that that's feasible with this. I would love to see 25% of students district-wide participating in the program to start at least once a week because if that's how if if that's how we start that's how we start and you know there are all kinds of ways that we can engage the kids to um, to take part in in helping us figure out what it is they want and how they're going to come in um, so we're working on some stuff with that too again at the middle school but I, as a, again, I figure if I can make it work with those guys, we can make it work anywhere. So with a sixth grader, um, he would give you all of my money, mm -hmm. just so you know, um, for food every day. Good. Um, I limit him to snack cart. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they do call it. Yeah. Twice a week. He would do it every day. I sure. have to go in and check because he cheats um, and gets it more often. So it's good. It's yeah. a good problem to have, you know, but... Maybe it's a education for parents too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've had a lot of, of calls um, with parents about their bills because they had no idea that their kids were eating more. <laughs> and I don't mean the snacks, I mean meals overall. So obviously I take that as, as a compliment, um, especially on behalf of my staff who actually does the cooking. Um, but it's, you know, it's a good sign. Um, and it's a good sign that when I have those conversations, the parents generally will just put more money on the account so the kids can keep eating. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Jen. Um, I just had a question about free and reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. So if there's, if someone qualifies for a free and reduced lunch, do they actually have to like swipe their card for, I don't know if that's what they do, but to get paid for that, do you get paid like for each meal, each yep. kid? So it's not just kind of like a blanket, this you many have kids, kids get so free get and reduced lunch. No, you get, no so it's it's specific to the child. Wow, um, and it's only it's they only receive free or reduced meal benefits for a, a reimbursable meal. So that would have to have, you know, all of the components of that meal, 
um, to take it. It doesn't count for bottled water or you know stuff like that. It's just just a straight reimbursable meal. That definitely seems hard to 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 if the numbers are so low with free and reduced lunch. I mean that's a that's a hard thing to to plan for if if you have to bank on them taking the meal so yeah so that's that's what I'm not doing right now <laughs> last question for mm -hmm. me. but you did mention that there were a lot of bills that are unpaid mm -hmm. and that you've had success collecting some of that money this year some so I that probably goes towards the increased revenue for the year I, I, su forward. I suppose it would because those those checks are coming in and some of them do contain balances from the previous year. Mm -hmm. So that would be worth factoring in and I can run reports that, that would show us exactly that. Um, but um, but another thing that, that doing these collections activities and they are exhausting because it's one by one calling, leaving messages. I've been able to identify several families who just who either did qualify for free and reduced and didn't apply. You know, they'll just say, I didn't feel like it or I forgot. Um, so we've been able to qualify them and, and bring in that additional revenue and in some cases be able to backdate their eligibility and wipe some of the debt off. There, I mean, there are sp specific circumstances where we can do that. but. It also depends on if it's cash versus accrual accounting, right? So accrual accounting is once they take the food, whether you've collected the money or not, that's the revenue. Yeah. So I'm guessing that's probably how our system works. But part of my question was moving forward. If you have collected a large amount of the you know, unpaid balance, mm -hmm. are you projecting that the increase in revenue will stay steady? Because if you have already collected that money, you're not necessarily going to collect it next year again, hopefully. Um, people won't fall behind and um, so my question is you have a bump in revenue this year because of those collections What's oh uh, no I wouldn't year? attribute the bump in revenue to the collections oh, I mean good. we're okay. they were just talking about maybe a thousand or two thousand oh, dollars okay um, now that was probably 27 people combined um, but I, I I would I could still look at the stats month to month from September to December and see a, a steady slow increase upward so I know that the sales are trending upward and I know that the expenses have trended downward so I can say confidently that irrespective of the debt collection um, I think we're on the right track great Kate. what do you think is the most um, has been the most successful thing in driving your food costs down oh hmm. um, we get a, uh, an amount of money from the state every year um, to purchase USDA foods um, that's based on the number of meal sales from the, previous, the two previous years ago. And so we can use that, that money to purchase um, USDA commodities, foods like chicken or, or burgers, which we don't buy from them, um, canned fruit you know nice fresh fruits and vegetables we get beautiful Wyman's blueberries you know stuff that the government has taken out of the commodity stream and diverted towards the school district to kind of control their markets um, and so when I got here I took a look at what was planned for this year and I flipped out <laughs> and and um, with Becky's support and Department of Education, I met with, uh, with Child Nutrition Services and we were able to reconfigure almost the entire thing, including setting some money aside um, to, to buy fresh fruits and vegetables from native Maine. They allowed us to take some of that federal money this year and buy from a supplier who ended up native Maine got the bid. So that helped. Um, me, but menu planning has always been my thing. I love to do it. I love to look at a menu over the course of a week and see, you know, so how can those leftover meatballs be maybe reused two days later or frozen for reuse later? And so I've structured these menus so that things can kind of overlap. And what that does is uh, equally important, it reduces food waste. Um, it it, you know, it helps keep us on our toes and helps keep us creative. Um, so, those those are the major things. But I would say mostly uh, menu planning, and and really capitalizing on the essentially free food that we get from the government, 
um, and using it in creative ways to, to make appealing dishes. I just wanted to thank you again. I'm super impressed, um, especially with what you just shared about reaching out to the families. It's a tremendous public service and I think when I was in school, I don't think anybody ever thought that the lunchroom cared about the community and clearly you do and I'm sure that's felt um, by everyone in your staff and the whole district. So yeah, and it, the um, relationship that I've developed with uh, the guidance counselors and school nurses, you know, we're kind of we're kind of buddied up a little bit to try to make sure that we can provide the most benefit and so I have you know worked with them to make sure that I can extend any benefit I can even if the family doesn't technically qualify uh, because I am passionate about making sure that any kid who needs to eat is is eating so thank you thanks okay 9b is the consideration and approval for the 2018-19 school calendar. So this is the second read, um, and that was in your packets. It wasn't in what went home or got mailed out, but uh, it was in your packets today. Were we going to move to discussion? Or how did you want to handle it? Yes, I okay. think. I think you need to explain the changes okay. with the administrative team and I yeah. think that we had decided that we don't want to vote on this tonight right. because the public hasn't had a chance to see it. Correct. So that's, we'll, that's just, what we'll I have the clarify. discussion tonight and then we're recommending waiting until next week to vote on. Okay, so the changes uh, that you see there are th there are sort of three. Um, we had a lengthy discussion uh, with all of the administrative team. I believe the AT, it was the whole, uh, the directors were there as well, but um, uh, yesterday. And so they, they still prefer, you know, the original. Um, however, what we looked at, uh, I shared with them that we were looking at January 2nd. It was a day that the board felt that we needed to um, relook at. For a couple of reasons, one was because it was a shortened week and right after break. I, I can't remember the, the specific reason about the right after break part. And you also asked that we look at February 15th, the PLD day. So what we came up with uh, collectively was um, moving that January 2nd day to a student day and then taking that .5 PLD day and replacing the February 15th PLD that was there with the point five, and moving that PLD day from that February 15th to January 18th. So January 18th originally was a uh, student day. So those are the changes in front of you for you to so, Cynthia, talk about. Yes. Um, just point of clarification. So the PLD on the 18th of January, that is a full day PLD now? It is. So okay. basically it was the one that was February 15th that was moved there. Okay. And then the PLD before February vacation, that is a half day PLD? That's the .5 one that was on January 2nd. Yeah. So that would begin in the morning so there would be no students? No students. Or could you do the half PLD day? by doing a half day for students. So that day is not a, that does, that's not one of the student days. That would make it 176 days with the students having a half day as opposed to the 175 student days that we currently have. You'd be adding another student day. Or you just chop a day off at the end. Right. <laughs> and then add it for snow days because you're going to be right. there anyway. That's what I'm thinking. Right. Right. It's only half a day. Could we just have a half day of school and half day PLD rather than ax the whole day? for only half a day of PD? No, I think so it was going. So if we did that, we'd still ha we still, with the teacher's contract, would have to add in a half a PLD day. That would become like a early release if we did that. And so responding to what Michelle said, well, you could do it at the end of the year. I mean, we don't find that very productive to do a teacher in service day after the end of the year right the point that we had talked about previously is that we need 
opportunity for ongoing uh, professional development through the year to work on like the math program. I wasn't program. implying that we would do PLD at the end of the year. I just thought we would make the day. Because you said we'd day. have an extra student day. Right. So take a student day off the end of the yeah. year was my point. Yeah. I, that's what I, that's what I it yeah. But, if we but got, that wouldn't be considered but a But that still doesn't PLD. solve. We, need yeah. a, we still need a point five professional de development day for teachers without kids. What? Well, that's a half day. That would be, yeah. It because would be our contract day. is 182.5. And if you, if you bring kids in at the same time, then it really isn't it's considered a point student five. Day. <laughs> right. Oh, I feel like I need a whiteboard. Yes. <laughs> it's still considered a student day. That 175 days, that would be one of the students, 175 days. Mm -hmm. So if you take the 175, and then you need to add that 5.5 plus the two um, comp days that they get. Mm -hmm. Just, that's the whiteboard mm -hmm. that I'm trying to share with you. <laughs> but I don't have so it. Where have, we, where have we previously, we have done that. Um, this year we did it right after uh, the holiday break, but right. that's unusual. We have not yeah. previously done that. So it was February fifteenth, I think, the year before. Was it? Yes, it was. Wasn't it? Yes, it was. A My administrators okay. are saying yes. I was trying to figure <laughs> out because didn't we have? Didn't we used to have a half? Uh, um, when they started, there was a half day in those PLD days leading up to the beginning of school. Mike. So that's before my tenure, uh, Lisa. Did you go to? Come on now. <laughs> Somebody was here. I Watch know Watch the it. cord. <laughs> We've tried all kinds of different configurations, and I think that was one year that we did that because we didn't have enough days to do two, and so we ended up with like one and a half. Okay. I think that was about five years ago. So, so uh, we're pretty familiar with what the contract says right now since we're in the middle of negotiating it. Right now it guarantees them 180 days. Historically, we have done 182.5 days. Is there is there um, and it's 175 student days yes. and then two professional comp days so we're at 77 and then five and a half PLD days correct and two of those are prior to school and the other three are embedded in the and I think the only time that you haven't uh, given them the 182.5 days is I think there was a curtailment right. one year and that's why the contract is written that way just to help protect us if something happens mid-year with the state. So one question about that. If you have a half a day with lunch served, that counts as a student day. Right. Well, Why can we have the half day count as a student day and then the afternoon for that day count as a 0.5 professional learning day? Does it have to so be we'll on a day? For a day? Because, and a half because you'd be that. paying them 1.5 days for a day's work. Because right, typically if we do an early release or a half day, they're staying and doing PLD for the rest of the day, but that's just their regular student day. Correct. Because they're being paid. Right. Okay. <laughs> so we had an early release day this year already. Yes. 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 And the teachers stayed yes. and but did PLD. But it and we paid them for a, PLD a, a day. It did not count as a PLD it day. It counted as a student day. Right. But it was listed as PLD on the calendar? No, it was listed as an early release. It was listed as an early release. Okay. So right now, this year's calendar has five PLD days plus an early release day. Correct. Five and a half plus two early release days. On here? Oh, this year. The, oh, the this year, year we're in now. Oh, December, five and a half. December 6th was our only early release day. And the half day was uh, January 2nd, this year. That was the half PLD day. Cool. So we got six days of PLD. Five and a half. Six. Because they had another early release that we used for PLD, but we didn't call it a PLD day. Oh, yeah, I suppose that's true. Right? If, if you, if that's <laughs> how you need to think about it. <laughs> yes. As far as there, there was professional learning those days. Just as there is in staff meetings and other times. So I have one more question just to wrap this up. But uh, <laughs> for the contract. Oh, okay. Lindsay had her hand uh, Lindsay I'm totally lost. 
about we do need not, a whiteboard. Not about the math, but okay. what is the point of what we're trying to do? I mean, I just I can't even contribute. I don't even know what we're trying to do here. Right now, uh, the, the <laughs> <laughs> so at the last board meeting, there was we presented a calendar that covers all the days that everybody's supposed to be working and all the days students are supposed to be in school. But you didn't like some of the recommendations so we came back to the administrative team and we're presenting you a different scenario than the one we presented last time to consider because I think one of the concerns goal, in, yeah what were the concerns the concerns in February I think was weather um, being typically February is the snowiest although Oh wait, today's the last day. We do not have one snow day in February this year. Right. We made it through the That's whole awesome. month. So the combination between Feb break and snow days and PLD days right. was a bit too um, and the shortest month lacking the in school yes. for some people's blood. And I think one of your biggest concerns, which I, you know, can understand, is that because we can, even though the teachers. A lot of the teachers really liked it, and the administrators coming back the day after vacation. Then it was going to just leave a two-day week that first week back, and that was a. So we we really looked at, you know, doing three student days when we come back in January. I appreciate that, Kate. <laughs> okay, so now that I think I understand this, and I'm thinking back to what we were talking about at the last meeting. I thought the intent for the 15th was for that then to be what we're calling an early release day with PLD in the afternoon. A half day student day. I think that was partly Valley's concern about uh, doing the PLD days in February with the snow, snow days. I don't think it had anything to do with so, so much trying to do a student day and a PLD day in one. I think this is a new thing you're thinking about the board as a whole. No, but she's right. And we bring it up. I did bring up the fact that, okay, if we need to have PLD during the winter, at least we can have a half school yeah. student day and the PLD combined. So oh, we are not giving up a whole confusion. day of student instruction to be able to accommodate the PLD. So I was trying to look mm -hmm. for any way where there could be continuity for PLD without basically not bringing the kids into school so frequently. So uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about that and a lot of, so from our perspective, there are a lot of parents that sometimes will pull their kids out on that day because then if they're going someplace warm, they get cheaper flights. <laughs> flights. Uh, so the other thing that we talked about was, you know, if, if the board felt strongly, we wouldn't mind moving it to the Monday. 25th. So that would be another option that we could do. Um, but we felt like we kind of really wanted a day in February. Um, okay, I'm just going to say one more time that... <laughs> My understanding of the discussion around February was the what you had just said. Luckily, we didn't have any snow days this February, but usually it is a, a month that we have very few student days. And that was one of the days that I remember talking about the 15th being a way to still have the professional learning, but make sure we can count as many days as possible, especially with that dreaded February vacation in there. <laughs> um, yes, I am still in favor of no February vacation. Um, but to get as many student days in February as you can, so we're not pushing so late into June. So in other words, rather than have a PLD in February, if we absolutely need to have professional development, let's have an early release in February, not a full PLD. Okay, so I think maybe that this is the first time this is really sinking in with me. So what I so I'm hearing. Okay, so this is where Region Ten probably comes in, Cynthia. Because well, the early releases are on Wednesday in Brunswick, and we're trying to align. So the two early releases that are in the calendar in December and May are on Wednesdays to pair up so that the Region Ten students 
aren't affected in a negative way. But I guess we could theoretically. Could you swap change, those, change, and it's not every February fifteenth to an early release because that still counts as a student day, so it wouldn't be a conflict with uh, Region Ten. Right. And make May the eighth a PLD day. Yeah, that's no, okay. A PLD day. Oh, right. A half PLD. Oh, right. And yeah. then that doesn't mess with the calendar. I mean, I don't know how parents are going to love that. To have just a Wednesday off. have a Wednesday, the full day off with kids. So, so that's... So that or, might that might affect frankly, our, true, num right? our number of different days because if we're not having students, I'll have to look at that. But that would be, that would be responding so to, different. I think, what you guys are saying. But I think it would be okay because the PLD on the 15th is currently out of sync. So if we went to school that day, it would no longer be out of sync. So we could be out of sync. So it should day. be a wash. Should be. I just have to check mine. Confirm that, yeah. Yeah. We're not voting tonight, so I'll just verify. Right. So I really think what the board needs to grapple with is, you know, how are parents going to feel about in the middle of the week having a full day off? <laughs> and, and we could either do December the 5th or may the 8th because okay, so, they're both early release so we're release. picking wednesdays because that's their early release day right but does it if we're already off it doesn't matter so you could move that to friday february or december 7th instead of yeah. wednesday december 5th if you wanted to right. either of these you could move this one here or you could move this one here i mean there's no reason to keep it on a wednesday the only reason you were keeping it on the Wednesday was because of Brunswick's early release, right? But if our kids aren't going to be there anyway, it doesn't matter if it matches up with Brunswick's early release. Oh, I see. If we don't I have, have an early release, but Brunswick does, is that out of compliance? No. No. Because okay. they're student days. So I was going to suggest I may, rather than have that Wednesday, the, whatever, the 8th, could we just have... Friday the, Friday the 24th because it's not going to put us out of sync out of compliance with Brunswick I mean it is out of sync with the early releases but we have a whole district here that is basically responding to early releases um, in region 10 and I, I understand the sentiment that we want to accommodate the region 10 students but at the same time everybody else has to and along, actually which is a tall order. I so, really like the 24th because what we're looking to replace is a half PLD day, right? So we could call that a morning PLD day, and staff might really appreciate getting out at noontime on Memorial Day weekend. So I'm going to look to my principals. They're all not looking uh, at like, me. Yeah, I know they're not. Uh, <laughs> they're looking down like, don't call on me. Uh, <laughs> and so I feel Lisa's like... Lisa's on the edge. <laughs> Kick her out. <laughs> I feel like we picked earlier in May for some assessment reason, but I'm not sure about that. So, Lisa, I'm going to look to you about why did we have it earlier in May? And if there's not any good reason, then I'm happy to go to the 24th. I think we felt like the engagement from staff would just be better and when we were thinking about the timing of some of the data some of the placement issues it was really about um, what the pacing of the year looks like as far as quality professional development time oh, I'm gonna be the next one on crutches <laughs> no yellow <laughs> Um, all right, so I think that's another alternative. So can you repeat the yep. last? So I think the I think what it would be is uh, February second would become an early release. February? No, two. I'm looking at two. So I'm making it the second. February fifteenth would be an early release. Okay. And then May eighth moves to May twenty fourth, and it's a half PLD. So are you disregarding what you just found? 
No, I'm no. Well, I mean, the other option is, you know, if you want to, if you guys, pref- if it messes with the pacing and you prefer to keep that date, then you could move December fifth to December seventh and make that a half PLD day that day. No students at all. Half PLD day. No, no, no. Oh. Not on a PLD day. It doesn't impact that. Only when it's closed. So, uh, yeah. So May 24th, 0.5 PLD. So or, that's, the, that's the proposal. Proposal one is February 15, early release. So students would come mm -hmm. and then leave half day. So if they wanted to catch that night flight. Right, okay. And then May 24th, you're going to cross off May 8th and move the point five to the 24th. So that's version, that's option one. Mm -hmm. And did you have another option? So that option two would be to move December 5th to, so February moves to the early release. Yep. And then December 5th moves to December 7th as a half PLD day. O option three. <laughs> you move. You move December. Can we mock up some Nike art? Where, is anybody else having this flashback? December 5th moves to December 21st and just add it to the Christmas break. So December. we we talked about the December twenty first and and no value added. Everybody is no fried, and I just it oh we just, have to consider the teachers. <laughs> yeah, no value added. I was thoughtful in my consideration by putting it a long weekend for Memorial Day. They would like that day, I'm sure, anyway. But there's no value, you know. Yeah. 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 No, what do you care, Naomi? Yeah, yeah. You're not We're gonna be here. Kids to visit you. <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess those are... So I'll ask the administration. First, I'll check to make sure we're not dissimilar by more than the five days. Yes. And then I will check with the administrators to see which option they right. would like to respond to for the next time. Maddie. Are we done with this part of the discussion? <laughs> I have another question. On not this? pertaining, um, but pertaining to the calendar. I brought it up last time. We didn't discuss it, but I've sensed general agreement that we might change Columbus Day. <laughs> to Indigenous Peoples Day. That's not changed here. I, I don't agree with that. I didn't speak up because I didn't know. I mean, I don't get, we didn't have a discussion on it. I think that's just going to stir the pot and cause, I don't think everyone in all three communities would agree with that. And I don't know that it's worth stirring the pot. <laughs> Jen. I agree. I think that's a much bigger um, decision than the the school board's decision to change the name of the of the holiday. I think it would be a board decision. Maybe people are not ready right now to have a discussion, but I think it would be entirely appropriate for the board to decide how we want to call the holiday on our own calendar. I did take the liberty of reaching out to a member of Freeport's town council. And they have not discussed it yet, but I was told that it could be a board decision. It could be a district decision. Okay. I would need to understand a lot more about um, why or how you would change, why you change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, because I don't really understand the meaning behind um, taking a day just a random day it would seem at that point labeling it as indigenous people's day i don't understand the the concept behind it i won't spend a lot of time on it now but um just generally speaking a lot of towns have made this change and some states have been looking at it as well um in consideration of columbus's character and what was perpetrated on the Native American population. So it's it's a, a shift in the times and people looking at history with um, more kindness toward what happened to Native populations when Columbus came here. Okay. Um, did you? I just thought, is that clear, or should I, I could go one step further? Um, no, I, it's okay. Millions I, of people died of diseases and warfare as a result, direct result of his discovery. 
Um, and so that's where the debate is happening among historians, you know, who are revealing more and more about historically what happened. So it seems almost inappropriate to be celebrating a mass tragedy. That's it's still a federal a holiday yeah. is the point, right? What? It's, it's still a federal holiday. Yeah. yeah. But that's what um, Maddie is saying is that there's a lot of movement among um, other governmental institutions, states, and towns to, um, you know, make an effort to change that based on historical revelations that are more well accepted now than they were when Columbus Day was established. Yeah, and I understand all of that. I And so maybe that I didn't um, explain what I'm trying to understand really is why wouldn't, like it's almost like at that point you should just not have Columbus Day. I don't know. Oh. Okay. Something else, just have it, don't recognize it. Yeah. Is your is your mic on? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Turn it on. Turn it. I was gonna say. <laughs> the idea is to try to repair some of the damage that it was done historically in this country, and it's a step towards not a financial reparation, but a um, 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 an apology of sorts to honor those people and to um, fix a mistake. Acknowledgement. An acknowledgement. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I I think um, I think I'm not sure who said it, but it, I'm not sure it's something we have to decide tonight. Um, it could be something that if we want to pursue further, we can see if we can find some background on who's doing it. You know, what are the? Can you just change the name of a federal holiday? Can you you know reference it however you'd like? Yeah. Um, I uh, know a woman named Molly and Smith who's talking to a lot of different groups and she worked with Portland and Bangor um, and she's with the Penobscot tribe she is uh, considered their tribal ambassador which was a position that never existed before and she's traveling all over the country talking about issues uh, around this and I'm guessing if we invited her to come speak she'd be happy to do that okay thank you Lindsay um, I'd be in favor of um, board members, you know, doing whatever research they want and us including in the vote on the calendar, um, changing the name of the holiday to Indigenous Peoples Day. And you can vote for it or against it in this calendar, but it, it would be an opportunity for us to um, show our leadership and what we think about the subject matter and people can, I mean, you can all read about it and, and then just vote however you will in the next calendar for whatever we is this the a, a week from now or two weeks from now um, uh, that we, we would be voting on this calendar I think the 14th or the 28th um, do you want it's me not on the 7th it's not on the probably we want to put it to the 14th because I think we have so many options that they gave us that it might be nice to you know decide Absolutely. on one and then bring it back yeah is, is the name, would the name be part of compliance with the other districts? Do we have to keep? I like, don't think that. I'm just I have no, I I have no idea. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to do some research. Yeah. I know Bangor adopted it this month as a, as a, ta as a city. Yeah. I was just looking up really quickly right. and there's several states that have done it and then there's individual cities like Los Angeles just did it. Los but nothing about school boards. Bangor. Just yeah, <laughs> no, nothing about school boards have I read though, but yeah. Yeah. That, that kind of goes with what I said the first, you know, that I didn't think it was a board thing. I, I Hearing you say that Towns adopted it, I mean, that that's where I, I feel like it belongs, but that's just, yeah, um, that's my opinion. Well, and I think, you know, in cities like Bangor, where they have their own school district, they would, you know, it would carry through, but where we have individual, I mean, multiple towns coming together. And um, Molly and I'm sure could provide maybe testimony or, or you know speeches or whatever instead of if we if we want to move this forward I may be able to just share it through email yeah um, or and she also has like a one page yeah fact and, sheet. and more information about what other towns are considering it or districts or whatever governmental entities or yeah great thanks one second uh, one, Jeremy 
One, I just, oh, sorry. I, um, just, uh, Carter, I'd like to see if you could get some student uh, involvement in, in that too. You know, is there an interest in it, and, and you know, maybe bring back as part of your report? Um, so I know that this was. I haven't heard a lot about this topic until tonight, but um, especially among among my fellow students in a while. I mean, I heard it. I heard more about it on the news and a couple, like five or six months ago. But I think that having the board acknowledge it, or at least like seek it out and have like a fact sheet or something that we do, sends a message to the students as they are taking it into consideration and even if we vote not to that they'll still know that we were thorough in that kind of a sense but I'd be more than happy to drum up some um, perspectives from students around the district that'd be great thank you great idea Jeremy and there might even be a third option perhaps we don't call it either Columbus Day or Indigenous Peoples Day but we simply refer to it as national holiday <laughs> <laughs> Name your own holiday. <laughs> now, Michelle, before we move on, because yep. I see you're moving on, I did want to ask a question about early release. What does that mean? Does it mean half a day? Does it mean two hours? Does it mean late start? What does it mean? Because oh. that part of the discussion to me is very relevant in terms of how many early releases we have and where we put them. To. So we did discuss the option of late start, and it was unanimous that um, for a lot of reasons that no one wanted the late start um, can't remember the transportation was one of the biggest issues um, and then the early release Sorry, um, can you explain a little more the transportation yes because yes because in the past when they did have late starts Bomar was the carrier for the Durham students and that made it easier to do that whereas now we have the whole fleet and the navigation of that would be not undoable for you taking some students, some students coming late and then some having early release. Because remember you talked about the middle school and the high school having a late start. So we discussed that at our AT meeting and um, transportation was not the only issue but it was one of the issues that was the biggest issue of concern. You don't have to explain it now, but okay. I would like to know the details of why it would be not possible to have the first run be for the lower grades and then have a second run for middle school and high school, which would be basically an hour later, which is what we have now. Right now we have I think the, the early bus. The high school was also up. I think concerned. the major thing was for Durham, they're on one schedule. Yeah, it's a different time start. That's what I'm remembering. Yeah, and then the high school, yeah. I think it was, she says, we have a hard, the fact when they're here, you know, getting them here later, it would be much more complicated. So that was Jen's feeling about that as well. And then early release reducing, because I think that was the other concern you had, or question you had about reducing it by an hour. And Lisa, do you remember the? Um, it limits our ability to come okay. I was just going to repeat it. But. Ginny, ye yeah. Ginny yells at us if we don't have people. All right, all right. Um, there were a couple of issues. One was the um, the less time, the less likely we were, especially at K-5, would be able to do any kind of cross-building work. And the other piece to that is we don't really gain any instructional time, because right now with the half day, we're able to do um, an abbreviated lunch, and they don't do the recess. But if they stayed, basically that's what would get added back in, would be the lunch and recess. So we don't, wouldn't add instructional time so you can keep the abbreviated lunch and no recess if you had a two-hour early release rather than a half day you can't do that it we just felt like that would that would kind of be pushing kids over the edge like as far as the time goes it just it felt like we weren't going to add instructional time and we'd be taking away PLD time uh, yeah, and at that K-5 level, they do a lot of going to the other building. They, they, they can have their lunch, and then going to the other building and doing a lot of really great professional development that's tailored to them. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lisa. 
you know, and a lot of the times, though, these questions are really just, you know, we can come up with great ideas in our heads, and it's your job to tell us why they're not great ideas anymore. <laughs> we think they're great ideas in our heads, but we don't have all of the experience and expertise that you guys have to tell us why it's not. So, thank you. All right, so we are not voting on this, right? Correct. We're just looking at it, and so it'll be back on the 14th. <sighs> Let's hope not. All right. So, well, that was a long 10 minutes. New business. Um, <laughs> board policy, uh, board comments, board policy, policy committee. Uh, Naomi, are you doing it in Candy's absence? It's easy. It's just never bored. <laughs> it's just this guy. Yeah. So, it's a short one. Oh, this one. Okay. So, at our last meeting on February 2nd, we reviewed the Individualized Education Programs Policy, Referral and General Education Interventions Policy, and Grievance Procedures for Persons with Disabilities, and there were no changes recommended, so those stayed the same. Um, we finalized the first draft for class size and brought that for discussion on the 14th here to the board. and. We tabled independent educational evaluations until our meeting this Friday to discuss. And that's at 8.30 this Friday for all who want to attend. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Any questions for Naomi? Now's your time to drill her with questions. <laughs> no? All right. <laughs> um, I did. Thank you for not using it. Um, all right, policy review. So uh, just a reminder, consideration and approval of the following policies. We are looking at child find and weapons violence and school safety are the two that are up for, for a second and final read tonight. Class size is going to get moved to the 14th. And we have no new information. And, and so unless uh, there are more questions, we are ready for a vote. Do we have a motion? Naomi? Second from Jen. Any other questions? All those in favor? Opposed? None. Thank you. Well, that was the quickest 25 minutes on, the, on record for us. <laughs> okay, so we will open it up for public comment. No? All right. I know. <laughs> the crowd, they just can't decide who wants to talk. Um, all right, so then we need a motion to enter into executive session as outlined by MRS 1 MRSA section 4056D for the purpose of discussing administrator negotiations for RSU 5. Naomi? Sarah? All those in favor? None opposed? 822. But guys, I hope you are all ready for a picture because. Um, oh, yes. oh, thank you for finding me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Ginny told me this afternoon, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. 